And welcome to the webinar on using biofungicides, biostimulants, and biofertilizers to, to boost crop productivity and help manage vegetable diseases. This is the second webinar in a two-part series from the Tomato Organic Management and Improvement Project, funded by NIFA OREI and led by Lori Hoagland of Purdue University. This is your host, Alice Formiga of the eOrganic Community of Practice at extension.org. You can find all eOrganic articles, videos, and recorded webinars on our website and also on the eOrganic YouTube channel. The presentation will last between 45 minutes and an hour, and then we'll have 30 minutes for questions. After the presentation is over, we'll be reading as many questions out loud as we can. So today, I'm very pleased to welcome back Lori Hoagland and Dan Eagle of Purdue University, along with Maria Teresa Cardarelli of the Italian Ministry for Agriculture and Forestry in Rome, Italy, and Giuseppe Colla of, let's see, of Tusha University in Viterbo, Italy. They will be providing an overview of recent efficacy studies on a variety of available products and discuss strategies for identifying the most effective products and application practices. So with that, I'm going to hand over the screen control to our first presenter, Lori Hoagland. Okay, great. Thank you, Alice. <laughs> we look like all of us, so hello, everybody. Um, and as Alice mentioned, um, this webinar is brought to you by the Tomato Organic Management and Improvement Project, which is a large, multidisciplinary, multi-state project funded by NIFA or OREI program um, with the main goal of helping tomato growers manage foliar pathogens while delivering tomatoes that have good flavor to the local marketplace. And as part of this project, we have three research areas that we're working with. Um, one is developing improved tomato varieties, which we talked about in a webinar on March 7th that is now archived at the eOrganic website as well as on our Tomi project website. Our second component is identifying factors and mechanisms that regulate induced systemic resistance, which is an enhanced defense state in plants mediated by beneficial microbes, which we'll be talking more about at a webinar next spring. And then the third component is identifying effective biopesticide and biostimulant combinations. And so that's um, the focus of today's webinar. So there are a wide range of different agricultural biological products that are available today in the marketplace um, with claims reported to boost crop productivity, help plants tolerate abiotic stress, and even protecting plants from pathogens. However, unlike a lot of um, more chemically based products, in some cases they can have um, inconsistent results under field soils or field conditions. And so unfortunately they're often um, labeled as or snake oil. And so the purpose of today's webinar is just to provide a little bit of more information about these products um, and how they can be used to increase um, efficacy. So to start, um, we just wanted to talk a little bit about what these products are. Um, they can be based or contain microorganisms themselves like bacteria, fungi, and different viruses or they might be microbial products like metabolites that microbes produce, such as antimicrobial compounds, or they can be the result of plant and animal byproducts, um, like the picture of neem oil that you see here that has some um, pest um, control efficacy. So these products can be developed in a number of ways. Um, some of the microbes that are in these products have been isolated from soil and plant surfaces, often um, in locations where they, um, plants are under stress, like a, a field where disease is prevalent or there are very low nutrient concentrations. And so you can isolate microbes that will have benefits to plants. Others, um, like trico this Trichoderma harzianum isolate, um, could be developed in the lab, like this one that was developed by Dr. Gary Harmon at Cornell University, where he took two strains of Trichoderma that had beneficial um, mechanisms and mated them to produce better um, isolates for microbial products. They can also be just um, the byproducts of an industry like fish waste or byproducts that have been specifically um, chemically treated in a way to um, get the best um, compounds out of it that have benefits for plants. 
So they provide potentially numerous benefits to plants um, from helping them to acquire nutrients and water. Um, they can affect hormonal processes within the plant that um, affect the metabolism of a plant and its physiology and how it performs. And then some have very specific mechanisms that they can use by, for example, producing um, antimicrobial metabolites or inducing systemic resistance to help plants fight pathogens. So depending on where you're at, um, these products are generally um, classified into various categories. So here in the U.S., you often see these products classified as either a biofertilizer, a biostimulant, and a biopesticide. And the reason they're put into these classes is often because of their uh, market potential. Um, so for example, if a particular product has really good efficacy to help control diseases, a company might go through the extra steps needed to get this classified as a biopesticide. But in many cases, some of these products, you know, they can fit into numerous categories and they might have multiple benefits. Um, an example of that is trichoderma species. So trichoderma are a beneficial soil fungus that are often cited for their potential to as in biocontrol, particularly for the control of soil-borne pathogens. But they've also been found to provide other benefits for plants. Um, for example, I did a study a few years ago um, with an inoculant from a company called BioWorks where we found that by applying this product to tomato seedlings when they were germinating, we had much stronger tomato plants when we went to transplant and then when we took them into the field they were better able to withstand the heat and high wind um, that plants undergo during transplant stress. So the challenge with these products is that um, the regulations regarding classification depending on what country you're in can vary dramatically and even the requirements for reg classification or efficacy studies can vary even in um, what state you're in, like for example here in the United States. Um, another challenge is that for some products there are a lack or has been a lack of independent scientific and objective field trials and how um, the performance of these and the efficacy of them. And then lastly, unlike chemically based fungicides and um, pesticides and, and other fertilizers, um, there are fewer regulations on how best to apply these. And so and oftentimes where they perform best is when plants are under stress. So understanding some of these factors um, can help to just think about how best to improve the efficacy. Um, so just in general, when thinking about, you know, how to improve efficacy or, you know, which ones you should use, um, it's important to think about the exact need that you're interested in and choosing appropriate products. Um, thinking about storage conditions is very important. So a lot of these products are um, microbial in origin, and so they are alive. And if you, for example, put them in the car at 100 degree heat for an afternoon, you might actually kill the organisms that are living in those products. Um, next, it's best to really understand, you know, the right dose, how to apply it, when to apply it, to apply it, you know, sometimes more isn't always a good thing. You can go too far um, and overwhelm the plant in some cases. Um, and then just thinking about environment. For example, if you apply a product and it rains a lot, you might need to reapply that product. Um, and then lastly, you know, particularly with the products that there's not a lot of testing that's been conducted on these, doing on-farm trials can be a really good way to think about and understand what, you know, you're really after in terms of um, the F or the mechanism that you're interested in, whether getting more nutrients or controlling pathogens and developing an on-farm trial to test those. And if you're not available or aware of this, SARE put out a really nice um, technical bulletin. It was just updated and is available online here. So next, um, through this talk, we're going to go through each of the three categories of these biological products and talk a, in a little bit more depth of what they are and how they can be used and how they have um, done well in certain studies that we've been involved with. And so to start, I'm going to turn that over to Dr. Maria Teresa Cardarelli, and she's going to talk about biofertilizers. Thank you. 
about biofertilizers, we don't have a legal definition for the term in US. Uh, one of the most used definition reports that biofertilizers are substances containing living microorganisms which when applied to seeds, plants, surfaces or soil colonize the rhizosphere or the interior of the plant and promotes growth by increasing the supply or availability of primary nutrients to the host plant. Which are the main benefits arising from the use of biofertilizers? First of all, biofertilizers can replace soil nutrients like the nitrogen. For instance, there are nitro nitrogen fixing bacteria based biofertilizers. Moreover, biofertilizers can increase the solubility of plant nutrients in the soil, making them available for plant uptake. This is very important for mineral nutrients like phosphorus, iron, manganese, zinc, that are often present in forms not readily available to plants, as in alkaline soils. One other advantage arising from the use of some biofertilizers in the increasing is the increasing of plant access to nut nutrients in the soil through a simulation of root growth or the development of specific microbial structures like the extra-radicular IFAL network in mycorrhizal plants. We have two most common groups of beneficial microorganisms used as biofertilizers. One includes the endophytic fungi, and the other refers to plant growth promoting rhizobacteria. Mycorrhiza fungi are the most commonly used endophytic fungi. They form a symbiotic association where the fungi colonize the plant's host root systems and form a large network of extra radical ending the volume of soil accessible to plant roots. The plant provides carbo carbohydrates and other nutrients to the fungus necessary for its growth and metabolism, whereas the network of IFE draw nutrients from the soil. This fungus plant aligns, simulates plant growth and improve tolerance of crops to environmental stress. stress. The most common mycorrhizal fungi, fungi in the agronomic and horticultural crops are arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. Rhizobacteria includes root colonizing bacteria that form symbiotic relationships with many plants. The rhizobacteria with plant growth promoting activity includes strains belonging to many genera. The plant promoting action can result from the production of plant growth promoting substances, ni nitrogen transformations, increasing bioavailability of phosphate and micronutrients. It's important to consider that in the environment, microorganisms are engaged in a wide variety of social interactions that have full establishment and maintenance of a microbial population in the soil. Two microorganisms can have a limited interaction because they occupy different microhabitats, or they can have a negative interaction like the one shown in the picture where a saprophytic fungus called Trichoder marzianum is in blue color here, is feeding the high fee and spores of a mycorrhizal fungus in pink color. On the contrary, two microorganisms can have a positive interaction, like the synergism between arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi bacteria in soybean. 
When is it useful to apply biofertilizers, especially in soil having low biological fertility or with adverse soil chemical and physical characteristics which limit the nutrient availability for plant uptake? The greatest benefits arising from the use of bay fertilizers are expected in crops with low nutrient uptake efficiency, like crops with the shallow root system, for instance, onion. The application of biofertilizers can also help to introduce selected bacteria, strains that are needed for improving specific crop traits, like nitrogen fixing rhizobia for improving nitrogen nutrition in legume crops. Okay, yeah. the biofertilizer effic efficacy is affected by the interaction of several factors that are genetic crop factors, environmental factors, and factors related to the intrinsic characteristic of biofertilizers. For instance, about the environmental factors, extreme temperatures can limit the growth of the microorganisms while soil pH can promote microbial growth or inhibit it. F cultural practice like soil tillage, fertilization, uh, irrigation with control and application of pesticides can strongly influence the effects of biofertilizer applications. Today, there are many formulates ca that can simplify the field application. For directed seeded crops, there are different ways to apply biofertilizers, like seed coating, particularly suitable for cereals, soybean, and other field crops. Biofertilizers in microgranule form can also be applied at sowing with seed drill equipped with microgranule distributors and be used for application at the early stage of crop growth. In transplanted horticulture crops, biofertilizers are often applied in nursery by mixing inoculum into the potting substrate prior sowing or by spraying the inoculum on the strays after sowing. Just before transplanting, biofertilizer can be applied on water suspension, like in young vine plants or in vegetable trays. At transplanting, biofertilizers are applied with drip irrigation systems or by placing tablet formulations in the planting holes. In this slide, I reported some pictures showing the results of several trials using commercial products containing a consortium of strains of arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi and Tychoderma troviride, provided by Italpolina Company, Italy and USA. In the first picture on the left, you see the effects of the application of a tablet product called Click on pepper under greenhouse conditions in Spain. And after 15 days, you can already see some differences on growth of treated plants in comparison with the untreated control plants. In the central picture, you see two apple trees. The right one has been treated with a microbial-based tablet in this case, the effects of inoculation were visible only in the second year after planting, with a more vigorous plant growth and better nutrient uptake. In the top right part of the slide, you can see corn plants from seed treated or untreated with the microbial consortium after drought stress period and you easily recognize that treated plants on the left side are more green than the control in the right side. Finally, in the last picture, you see a vineyard in Tuscany, Italy, 
where bare root vine plants have been inoculated with arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi just before planting, dipping the roots in a suspension of fungi. The differences were evident already in the first year after planting with a better growth of treated plants. The root colonization by mycorrhizal fungi in treated plants was more than 30% at the end of the first year, while in untreated plants, the colonization was between 10 and 14%. Um, concerning uh, biostimulants, we don't have a legal definition in the United States, uh, even if the term is quite often uh, uh, used uh, in the scientific literature. Um, recently, a non-profit organization of uh, uh, industry um, called uh, Biostimulant Coalition agreed with the uh, um, Association of American Plant Food Control officials to address biostimulants as new subcategories of beneficial substances, which are defined as any substance or compound other than plant nutrients that can be demonstrated by scientific research to be beneficial to plants when applied exogenously. It is clear that positive effects of beneficial substances cannot derive from the presence in the product of hormones, chemicals for controlling plant diseases, or plant nutrients, because these substances, compounds, are already included in the categories of pesticides or fertilizers. Biostimulant substances can be divided in organic or inorganic plant biostimulants. As you can see in these slides, humic substances, protein hydrolysates and seaweed extracts are the most common organic plant biostimulants, while the inorganic plant biostimulants include especially beneficial elements like silicon selenium. Because of the limited uh, uh, times, I'm going to consider only the organic uh, plant biostimulants in my uh, presentation. Uh, humic, humic substances are a mixture of complex organic compounds formed by transformation of organic residues by soil microorganisms. Humic substances are usually classified according to their solubility in water under different pH levels. We can distinguish humines, which are not soluble in water at any pH value, humic acids not soluble in water under acid conditions, and fulvic acids soluble in water under all pH conditions. Seaweed extracts are a mixture of compounds from seaweed biomass using different manufacturing systems, such as alkaline or acid hydrolysis, or cellular disruption under pressure of fermentation. The bioactive compounds in seaweed extracts include especially carbohydrates, and to a less extent, minerals, phenolics, amino acid, vitamins, and phytohormones. Obviously, according to the raw material, the manufacturing process, we can have products with very different characteristics and activity on the plants. Protein hydrolysates are a mixture of peptides and amino acids that are manufactured from protein sources using partial chemical and or enzymatic hydrolysis. Uh, protein sources are usually derived from animal byproducts and plant uh, biomass. Even if you can find many compounds in protein hydrolysates, the most important in terms of biological activity on plants are soluble peptides and uh, amino acids. Biostimulant substances can promote directly or indirectly grow of plants by improving nutrient uptake and assimilation, abiotic stress tolerance, and uh, increase product uh, quality. In these slides, you can see uh, different examples about the root stimulation of uh, some biostimulants in several crops. 
A wood stimulation is quite common after application of humic substances, protein hydrolysates, and seaweed extracts, and this often refers to an oxy-like activity of the products. It is interesting to notice that wood stimulation in, induced by biostimulant application is usually much more pronounced under low nutrient availability. This is another example of stimulation effect of biostimulant on plant growing productivities. As you can see in zucchini crop, the number of fruits increased uh, with biweekly for application of seaweed extracts, as reported in a trial conducted by Professor Wufel from University of Naples, Italy. Biostimulants can uh, improve uh, plant nutrition, uh, increasing the um, availability of nutrients in soils and promoting nutrient uptake and assimilation in uh, plants. For example, humic substances and protein hydrolysates can form complexes with micronutrients, limiting their insolubilization in soil solution, especially under alkaline conditions. Moreover, humic substances can reduce leaching of some nutrients thanks to their high cation exchange capacity. Nutrient uptake is usually increased after application of biostimulants because of the stimulation of root growth and nutrient uptake mechanism. Biostimulants can increase uh, tolerance of crops to abiotic stress like extreme temperatures, drought, and salinity. I just reported an example in lettuce where you can see a mitigation of the plant grow depression resulting from salinity when the plants were, have been treated with the protein hydrolysates. Biostimulants can also improve quality of edible product and especially their nutritional aspects. The improvement of nutritional quality of the product can be the result of the enhancement of photosynthesis, the increase of nutrient uptake and assimilation, and the activation of secondary metabolism. For example, there are several works showing an increase of soluble solids in tomato, a reduction of nitrate content in lettuce, and an increase of steel bean in the wine grape after foil application of different type of uh, biostimulants. This uh, slide shows some practical aspects of biostimulant application. Usually, in, uh, protein hydrolysates and seaweed extracts are applied both at foliar and root level, while humic substances are more suitable for root application. As the rules of thumb for biostimulant application, you have to consider that crop response to biostimulant treatments increases with the level of stress and under low fertile soils. Moreover, frequent applications of biostimulants at low rates are better than few applications at high rates. In the last uh, slide, I reported some possible strategies to follow for biostimulant applications in vegetable crops. In the left box, you can see a repeated application of humic substances to deep irrigation system to improve soil fertility, nutrient uptake, and stress tolerance. While in the right box, you can see for protein hydrolysates and seaweed extracts, root dipping of transplants just before planting, followed by repeated foliar application of biostimulants to increase crop tolerance to environmental stresses, nutrient uptake, and assimilation of the crop. Hello. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll go ahead and, and, and talk about biofungicides now. Like the previous speakers, I'll start off with a, uh, a definition. <laughs> So my definition is biofungicides uh, are, are fungicides which have an active ingredient from a biological organism, a living organism, or are derived from a biological organism. I'm going to divide uh, biofungicides for the purpose of this talk into three types. Uh, one is a biological products that have biological active ingredients, that is, derived from microbes or plants, but not necessarily living. Two, placeholders. Microbes that live on the plant surface compete with the 
pathogen, the disease-causing pathogen, slowing the disease, or, or perhaps producing some antibiosis. And three, a hyperparasites. These are parasites we place, living organisms we place on the plant to try to parasitize and, and kill or slow the, the pathogen that causes the disease. All right, let's, perhaps the best way is just to go into ex some examples. So the first example I'll talk about then is, uh, and, and uh, this is, uh, has a trade name, Serenade Opti, or you may have uh, heard the old formulation called Serenade Max. The active ingredient is a bacterium, Bacillus subtilis. Um, the, the mode of action then is membrane disruption. So the lipopeptides can cause membrane disruption, uh, slow germination of pathogens, inhibit uh, germination, etc. Uh, the next one then is a trade name fracture. Uh, it's a, actually a protein from the sweet lupin plant. It disrupts cell walls, uh, has a uh, uh, specificity, it has a wide range of pathogens it interacts with and a, a moderate residual. I'd like to mention that uh, fracture is at this point not organic, it's not on the list of, from the Organic Material Research Institute. It's not an ARMRI listed as of yet. Uh, they are coming out with a formulation later this year which is, um, which will be listed. Um, my next example then is uh, from an ex extract from not re knotweed, a plant. Um, the example is, uh, the trade name is Regalia. It induces plant defense. So for example, it tells the plant that it's under attack and that uh, uh, to, to produce uh, chemicals to, to defeat the, uh, the, the attack of the, of, of the disease. A wide range of organisms, of diseases it interacts with and, and moderate residual. Uh, the next one that I'll talk about has the trade name Pre-Stop. It is a living fungus. It, this is an example of a microbial placeholder. So this is a fungus, Glycocladium species, that when placed on the leaf, will, will live on the leaf and compete with the pathogen. So hopefully you get the pre-stop on before the pathogen gets a hold, gets started, and, and this will inhibit the pathogen. Also, there's evidence with Pythium and Fusarium that uh, pre-stop actually uh, will parasitize these, these fungi. Uh, there's a wide range of, of diseases that it's labeled against, and in the study I'll talk about in a moment here, we applied it every three weeks. What so has a nice long residual for the reason that uh, that it li actually lives on the surface of the plant if 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 all goes well. Um, I might mention to check and see if pre-stop is labeled in your state. Another example then of a of a placeholder uh, biofungicide then is Streptomyces lyticus. Uh, this is a bacteria uh, known as actinovate AG. Uh, the mode of action is, is competition and it produces antifungal um, uh, chemicals when, when on the leaf surface, so the plant surface has a broad specificity, uh, residual. Uh, it's repeated every seven to 14 days. It produces a wide range of, uh, of chemicals that can compete or, or uh, uh, have a zone of inhibition against the pathogen. Now, I'd like to move to a different category. These would be microbial hyper, hyperparasites. These are parasites of the pathogen that we're trying to defeat. In this case, it's, it's a microbe. It's another fungus. The trade name is Contans, and it, it is a parasite. And it's very, the specificity is very narrow. It only defeats fungi which cause white mold, for example, of tomatoes, uh, green beans. Uh, but the residual is, is, is moderate. It lasts in the soil. Uh, the label might tell you, for example, to apply it the, by irrigation or spray equipment the, the, the fall before. And if applied properly, reduce the overwintering structures of the fungus in the soil. Another hyperparasite then, this is known by the trade name agrophage. It's a, a, a microbial, it's a phage 
So it, it, it attacks the bacteria, in this case, the bacteria which cause bacterial spot, bacterial speck, and bacterial canker of tomato. And it's very specific. In fact, even within bacterial spot, there's some strains that it'll affect and some strains that won't. So you have to work very closely with the company in order to get uh, a strain that, that works in your area. Uh, it, we, the most growers I know apply it weekly. Um, it is NOP or National Organic Program uh, uh, listed, but it is not uh, OMRI listed. And now I'd like to talk about the, the organic fungicide trial we did for the Tomato Organic Management Improvement Project, both, both here and in North Carolina the past year. I wrote down here, OMRI approved products, that's true, except for the fracture, which I, I, I just mentioned, is not, as of this time, OMRI approved. We had to get it cleared through our certifier. The first product that we used then was a copper product with copper hydroxide and copper oxychloride. This is badge X2. Um, and, and we know that copper products have worked pretty well for organic growers for a while, but, but we wanted to compare this with some other newer products that are maybe uh, uh, easier on the environment. The second product that we used is a uh, trade name Oxidate, which is the actual ingredient is hydrogen dioxide. So this is essentially sanitizes the surface of the plant. Definitely not a biofungicide, but it is OMRI approved. And then we followed that product with a, a compost tea by the trade name Sustain. And, and the idea was that that had uh, beneficial organisms in it. And, and we hope to colonize the surface of the plant with uh, beneficial organisms. Uh, the next treatment is pre-stop, which I mentioned before. Um, Serenade Opti, which I mentioned before, and, and Fracture. And then we added uh, Cell Matrix. Uh, which is a silicone product, which as Giuseppe mentioned is a, a, a biostimulant. The diseases in both North Carolina and, and, and uh, Indiana that we saw were, were mostly early blight and septoria leaf spot, although we did not uh, inoculate. So here is, is the data then, and you can see on the graph, uh, as you go up the graph with higher numbers, uh, increasing height, there's, there's more disease. So you see, if we're, we're looking at the Indiana data first, then uh, the blue bar, the first bar, and I think I can take my, yeah. So uh, the blue bar I'm pointing to now is the untreated control. Uh, had a fair amount of disease here, and you see the A there. So statistically then, that's A, and you see the next bar is, uh, the orange one I'm pointing to now is, is badge, the copper product, and that's C. So this, product had significantly less disease than the untreated control, which, which we kind of expected. If you look at the gray bar, now I'm pointing to now, this is oxidate followed by the, the compost tea, the sustain, not significantly different in, in, in the amount of disease from the, uh, from the untreated control. The next is the, the yellow bar, this is the pre-stop, and we were excited to see that uh, there was, uh, this was significantly less disease than the, um, uh, untreated control. In fact, not statistically different from the copper. Uh, the next treatment then, the dark blue bar I'm pointing to now is Serenade Opti alternated with fracture, and this, we did not see any significant difference between this treatment and uh, the untreated control. This is Serenade Opti alternated with fracture on, on, a, on a weekly basis. And the final treatment then is the cell matrix which was applied under the soil uh, silicon uh, alternated with, with fracture. And again, we were not able to see any difference between this and the untreated control. However, when we moved to the North Carolina data, all of these treatments were significantly better than the un untreated control. You can see how much disease they had in, in North Carolina. Um, uh, again, we see that the copper, the orange uh, bar I'm pointing to now was significantly less than the untreated control. Um, but the really exciting treatment here is that the pre-stop uh, worked very well. And so in both locations, the pre-stop, which is a, works by competition on the leaf surface, the glioclatium product uh, worked very well to uh, uh, slow disease. I've been asked to talk a little bit about sprayer calibration and coverage. 
and I'll do so very briefly. One of the main points I want to make is for growers, and I work with some growers that have smaller areas, especially greenhouses and small plots, it doesn't make sense to, to, to have a, a, a bring a tractor in there. So uh, how do you, what, what equipment do you use? Well, uh, a lot of people will use uh, hand sprayers. I show what I call on the left a garden sprayer, and then I'll argue that the backpack sprayer on, on the right here uh, is, is much more appropriate for disease control, applying disease control products. You see here, this is a, a, a boom with three nozzles. Some, some have uh, more nozzles, for example. Uh, but this is uh, good for uh, uh, applying to a wide swath of area. You see here the, the, the pressure gauge, so I can constantly monitor the pressure that's going into the, to the pump. And here, uh, my hand is, is pumping and I'm constantly pumping and I can monitor that, to that spray. Uh, and then finally you see the backpack where, where it, you have probably usually a four to five gallon capacity. So then the, the, the advantage then of the carton sprayer, they're cheap and easy to use. The disadvantage is the nozzle output is variable. As, as you've noticed, when you turn those, it turns from a spray to a stream and the output varies depending on, on where, it, where it is and that can be easily bumped. Uh, the pressure and volume change over time. As soon as you start spraying, the, the pressure goes down and the volume goes down. And the wand arrangement in it uh, makes it harder to calibrate and spray than a boom. The backpack sprayer disadvantages, it's more expensive. The outfit I showed there is about $100. It's harder to maneuver in between rows, for example. But the advantage is the nozzles are made for pesticides. They, uh, it's a constant uh, arrangement. You can't bump it. The boom arrangement is better for calibration. And like I showed, you can constantly pump it so, so the pressure will be maintained the same way. Uh, I urge you to, to do some calibration. There's many methods of calibration. For example, a timing method where you determine the amount of water that comes out of your nozzles over time. Like for example, 60 seconds, determine how much time it takes to spray your plot. And then you can determine the amount of water that you'll need to mix the product in, or the area calibration where you know, add a known amount of water to the sprayer, spray out over the area or a portion of the area, dump out the water from the sprayer to determine the amount of water sprayed. Uh, just some, some quick tips, then the person doing the spraying should also be doing the calibration because we all walk differently and act differently. If the person or the equipment changes, uh, you need a new calibration. Uh, the foliage should be thoroughly wet, but probably not dripping. And perhaps most important, keep the speed constant. So use a, a metronome or music or in some way, uh, keep that pace constant. And I think Lori has one more slide. Great. Thanks, Dan. Um, so I just want to sum up a, a little bit, you know, what we talked about in that, um, you know, using these products is a, a little bit, takes a little more thought, I think, than some of the chemical products that are out there and, and thinking about when to put them um, into a crop system plan is important. For example, if you have very fertile conditions already or applying a lot of fertilizers, maybe chemical fertilizers, especially some of these biological fertilizers might not be um, as active. And so then just thinking about a holistic management plan, making sure the plants um, have um, good fertility, making that available, especially if you have um, deficient soils, and then managing abiotic stress and some biotic stress. There's possibilities with these biostimulants, and lastly, using target biofungicides um, for pathogens. So I want to just point out some additional resources here. Um, Ohio State University has a really nice um, new web page that they developed recently after uh, Dr. Kleinhens's lab. Um, it's called Bugs in a Jug. The website is available here if you want to get some more information about specific types of products that are available. Um, I also want to point out this special issue on biostimulants and horticulture that was published recently um, in Sciencia Horticulture ACA. It was um, edited by Dr. Cola, who spoke um, earlier about biostimulants, and it provides a lot of great um, scientific information on that's known today about different bio um, 
fertilizers and biostimulant products. And then lastly, I want to point out for those of you who would really like to get some more information that the third Biostimulant World Congress will be happening um, this fall in November in Miami and registration is now up. So um, with that, we'd be happy to um, answer any questions. Great, thank you. Um, we are going to have about 30 minutes or so for questions. If you have any general questions about organic farming after this webinar, you are always free to use the e-extension Ask an Expert service. But now I will move on without any further ado to the questions that we have coming in here. So, um, can the use of biofertilizers completely replace soil um, fertilizers. It may misguide growers from using these products by thoroughly cutting off applying fertilizers. Okay, so um, can, can these products reduce the use of fertilizers or um, do they substitute for the use of fertilizer? Yeah, so I guess um, I, I can start with that and hopefully others can um, chime in. I think that's an important point that, um, you know, I've never seen literature where these biofertilizers have completely um, replaced other types of fertilizers. So in different cropping systems, I see different, um, oh, different, I guess, rates. So I was just in Colombia recently and talked to some people where some of their, you know, biofertilizers, they think they can replace, say, in, in sugarcane, 50% of the nitrogen needs by using some of these biofertilizers, but the other 50% um, in those systems is still being supplied through um, chemical fertilizers or there are other means to provide nutrients like using leguminous cover crops, for example. Um, so does anybody else want to chime in on that? Feel free to unmute yourself because we <laughs> probably can't hear you. <laughs> If you're talking. Um, yes, I'm uh, Giuseppe Colla. Yes, we run several uh, experiments on using uh, especially mycorrhizal fungi and uh, uh, we have seen uh, that this uh, uh, microorganism uh, have uh, the potential to uh, reduce the application of uh, 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 um, synthetic uh, fertilizers or mineral fertilizers and uh, um, depending obviously uh, on the um, fertile conditions of the soil uh, uh, you can estimate between 10 30 percent maximum uh, uh, the uh, replacement uh, um, of, uh, for instance, of phosphorus, taking advantage of the capacity of the mycorrhiza to uh, solubilize and to make uh, more efficient the uptake of this nutrient for uh, for the plants. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, um, is there a biopesticide that is effective on the control of thrips and broad mites on tomatoes and cucurbits? This is uh, uh, Dan Eagle here, and of course I'm I'm a I'm a plant pathologist, so uh, I, I could come up with probably an answer uh, if given given long enough. But I, I don't uh, since I'm not an entomologist, I, I guess I don't feel comfortable right now. The the answer is probably yes, but I'd need to do some research. Okay, thank you. What about the use of Baker's yeast ferment liquid as a soil drench? Anybody know about that? I do not have experience with that. Okay. Yes, uh, me too. I never heard about that. Okay. Um, let's see. Are there um, observations that, um, let's see, wait. Are there tests or specific observations one can make to determine low biological fertility or lack of nitrogen fixing, rhizobia, etc.? Oh, that's a great question. And, you know, there's not a lot of commercially available tests. The best um, testing lab I, I'm aware of in terms of just kind of getting a sense of the um, biological activity of your soil is the Cornell Soil Test Lab. They have a really nice soil health test that gives you some insight on the physical, chemical, and biological properties in your soil. So um, they do not 
test specifically for um, nitrogen fixing organisms that I'm aware of, um, and I'm not aware of any commercial lab that does that. But I think you know they can provide some insight into the general health of your soil and provide recommendations. Um, and then I think you know doing some on-farm testing, it, it could be helpful to kind of figure that out in terms of having a control that doesn't have any, you know, you add no fertilizer to um, next to something that you do in, in different ratios to try to tease that out, but great question. Okay. Um, has anyone ever run DNA sequencing on the microbial products to confirm the contents match what is on the label? <laughs> Um, yeah, that's a great question. And so I know, you know, the the, the um, studies that I'm doing, Giuseppe and Maria Trace and I are conducting right now. We we're working with that with some trichoderma-based products and um, and a little bit of that. I haven't specifically worked with any um, consortia products in that way yet. I don't know if others have on the call. Yes, I think that uh, molecular uh, uh, techniques have uh, a great uh, potential to quickly uh, I, um, uh, identify the uh, microbials, uh, uh, the microbial community in uh, in a product, and this is very important. Uh, uh, um, so the tools are available. Uh, uh, um, usually, uh, these uh, um, are not uh, so used in uh, in a large scale. Uh, uh, but uh, um, what I usually recommend to the farmers that they want to use such type of products is first of all to check the label, to understand the label of the product. Uh, uh, because the label uh, need to be clear, need to report clearly. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, the number of propagules of the microbial, so that uh, you can, uh, let's talk about, for instance, uh, uh, um, um, uh, 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 spores of, of mycorrhiza. You can count that in the, with the microscope, uh, and so you can verify that. But when you don't have a clear label, so mm, mm, this uh, uh, make it difficult to, uh, to really uh, um, uh, um, control what there is inside. Obviously, you can use molecular tools, uh, uh, but uh, uh, this is costly and is not always available at farm level. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is there a list somewhere that provides names of products that are proven to work? Too many companies think too highly of their own products, which makes it difficult to sort through those that work and those do not, that, that don't. Do you have any suggestions? Yeah, so I would um, refer to the Ohio State University um, website, the Bugs in a Jug, um, that we put up here. I think, as far as I know, they're working on um, on that to get some more science-based um, information out there. And I think, Giuseppe, in that special issue that you edited, too, there are many um, studies within that that have tested some of the commercial products. Great. Okay, I put that link back up. Um, what about the use of biostipulants as a seed soak? Um, uh, biostimulants uh, can um, be used uh, for uh, promoting uh, seed uh, germination and uh, seedling establishment. Uh, uh, this is uh, um, well known from scientific point of view that there are uh, many uh, um, substances that can uh, um, um, stimulate uh, um, germination and uh, uh, promote seedling growth. Um, I, as far as I know, there are already several products in the market that are used at commercial level uh, uh, for coating at industrial uh, level, uh, uh, corn, soybeans, uh, and, uh, and other crops. Uh, uh, these products can come from uh, different sources. Um, I know that, for instance, uh, uh, protein hydrolysate and seaweed destructs are the best candidates to, uh, uh, to um, make uh, um, uh, these uh, um, uh, effects on, uh, on seeds. 
Okay. Um, let's see. We have used a product called EF400, which is Omni approved. We believe it has helped, but we're wondering if any of you have researched or know of research on this product. Um, I have not particularly tested that product. Um, any, yeah. Yes, me too. I'm not familiar with this uh, uh, product. Okay. Um, do you have any positive research or experiences with biofungicides on grapes for downy mildew or other pathogens? I, I, I don't. This is Dan. I, I don't. I don't normally work with grapes. And I, downy mildew is, is a tough one, I'll, I'll admit, but I, I, I don't. Um, let's see. Um, does the temperature affect the efficacy of these products or the efficiency? So, uh, uh, for uh, I think for uh, microbial-based products, obviously the the answer is uh, yes, because any microbial has its own range of uh, of activity. And uh, uh, even uh, for uh, for uh, biostimulant substances, we can have uh, different uh, responses uh, uh, according to the weather conditions. Uh, obviously, um, if you are um, uh, spraying a product uh, on the on the leaves, and we are uh, working in a very uh, um, hot day with uh, um, a very low humidity, we can expect a very low efficacy of the products. So oh, oh, this is uh, very important uh, to um, uh, um, uh, evaluate the weather conditions when you are spraying, uh, 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 apply any 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 products to verify that the conditions are suitable to maximize the efficacy of your uh, of your product. Yeah. Um, let's see, we have a lot more questions. What will be a good quality biofertilizer and how can a farmer who makes his own, um, yeah, how can a farmer um, know which biofertilizers to use? Um, well, I think the first thing to start is to looking at your soil and understanding what the deficiencies are. Um, and, you know, you just a simple soil nutrient test can tell you a little bit about how much available phosphorus you have, for example, um, or what, um, you know, nitrogen is much more fickle and hard to, to get a good sense of. But that that's a good place to start. Um, there are some labs I know too that will do testing on like compost um, to let you know if you're using that as a, a kind of a organic fertilizer at least to understand what the nutrient levels are um, in those and to apply that. And then I think my last suggestion would be just to, you know, in working with uh, reputable companies that do promote um, objective scientific testing and, um, you know, have demonstrated the field or, you know, especially with independent studies um, to show that they're good products. Okay. Um, what do you think of small farmers amplifying indigenous microorganisms for some of the same applications you discussed? Yeah, um, I, I would say it's an interesting um, concept and I, I believe, I, I wish I could I think of the study now, I think I was, it's somewhere in the Northeast I saw some, I think an extension publication on, for example, how to promote your own mycorrhiza or how to use trap crops to um, expand on your mycorrhiza. So um, I think there's opportunities in that and I think, you know, we've we talk a lot in, in the lab here too about you know just products that are for example isolated in Italy maybe aren't going to do the best here in the United States so there's definitely some regional um, considerations to think about um, you know again in terms of testing those products as Giuseppe mentioned some of the, the microbial tests can be rather expensive but I think you know doing some on-farm trials with what you develop and comparing to a control that you apply nothing and then you know trying a rate of 
say, you know, 100 pounds per acre or 500 pounds per acre and, and doing some, um, you know, with replications can be a good way to, to understand if what you've developed um, has good efficacy. Yes, I want to add that uh, uh, one point that is very important to consider is that uh, um, uh, um, it's very important uh, to be sure that uh, when you are multiplying your microbials in the, in the, in your system, you uh, need to uh, control to avoid uh, the um, uh, multiplication of potential pathogens for the plant. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, because uh, uh, if you are taking some uh, some uh, uh, roots that uh, contain mycorrhiza, but you bring with you nematodes or other type of pathogens, at the end you uh, risk to come out with uh, uh, inoculum that is contaminated with plant pathogens. So this is a recommendation that uh, uh, I want to to give to the farmers that. Uh, are going to use this technique to control, to be sure as much as possible that uh, also you are not uh, uh, propagating uh, uh, harmful microorganisms for uh, for your uh, for your coping system. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Yeah, and I wonder, yeah, even maybe applying it on a small scale in a more of a controlled environment like greenhouse first, just to test for some of those negative effects. And then we do have. Um, you know, test labs like at Purdue University, we have a disease and diagnostic lab that you can send material to to understand um, if you have pathogens present and, and they can test for nematodes as well. Okay. Um, what was the reasoning for alternating certain treatments in the biofungicides experiments and how were the different um, combinations of products chosen? Okay, so um, yeah, that's, that's a good question, and we, we kind of went back and forth over this uh, many times. Um, but, but the idea behind alternating uh, products like that is, is you're trying to uh, use different modes of action. So, for example, with the oxidate sustain, uh, the idea is use the oxidate, and you're, you're kind of doing a surface sterilization, and then come back with a sustain, and what you're doing is hopefully populating the uh, the plant with uh, beneficial organisms. In the case of the Serenade Opti, uh, there's a uh, bacterium that's beneficial, and you're alternating it with a, a product which is uh, supposed to be good against fungi. So, so hopefully you're having both, both two two different modes of action alternating the whole season long. With with conventional products, we talk about doing uh, uh, worry about modes of action, but for the most part, uh, with the exception perhaps of COP, we're not worried about uh, the fungi or, or the, yeah, the fungi becoming resistant to it. Uh, the cell matrix alternation, uh, that was silicon alternated with fracture. Uh, right then, we were trying, we're looking at two very different uh, uh, ideas there. One was trying to look at the silicon content, and there's been some evidence if you boost the, the silicon content of plants, you'll raise the uh, disease resistance and, and fracture completely different where we're go actually going after the pathogen. Uh, so uh, that, that, that was our rationale. Okay, so how about, this is actually a question for Dan, so um, hopefully we can still hear you, Dan. How about the use of electrostatic sprayers for biofungicide application? I, I have not, uh, I, I don't know if you can hear me now, I was yeah. kind of moving around before. Okay. Um, I have not used electrostatic sprayers. Uh, I, I, I kind of, I tried to get into that road grant for that some years ago and, and was unsuccessful. Um, I, I, it, it could work, but I, I haven't tried it, and I certainly have not tried it with uh, organic stuff. But, but I would think that it would just do a, a, a better job of uh, distributing it to the, uh, to the surface. I, I don't know of any uh, um, in, any problem with it. I, I've not heard of any. Okay. Um, how do users of different biologicals know whether there are negative interactions between microbes, for example, mycorrhizae and trichoderma? Essentially, how can we make sure we aren't just throwing our money away and purchasing different microbes for use on the same plant? Oh. 
That's a really good question. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I you know, have the answer for that. I don't know of any, I'm not aware of a database that really kind of talks about that, and I think that's kind of an important area of research. Um, some things, for example, like it's pretty well known that mycorrhizal fungi and, and rhizobia have, a, or well, there's quite a bit of evidence now, I'd say, to support those two seem to work really well together. Um, you know, there's a lot of interest right now in developing products that have these multiple organisms in them, and so I think there's needs to be some testing, um, in my opinion, before widely advocating those. Um, but yeah, Giuseppe, do you have? Um, uh, yes, uh, today there is a tendency to or increase uh, the number of uh, strains in the um, consortia of uh, microbial, thinking that um, if you have uh, more strains, your product uh, um, will work better. Uh, uh, this can happen, but this can also not happen. I mean, uh, uh, as we have seen from the presentation uh, Dr. Cardarelli, the, um, some microbials can uh, um, uh, negatively interact, uh, and um, this is the well-documented case of Trichoderma marciano with uh, Abusca mycorrhiza fungi, but uh, we have, uh, at the same time, for instance, for other strains, other species of Trichoderma, we don't have this negative interaction. So this just to uh, um, explain you the complexity of uh, uh, microbial interactions. Uh, uh, what I can recommend to the farmers is to uh, um, uh, ask for scientific evidence that uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the, the products that uh, the, the microbial that are in the products are really uh, compatible and are not uh, uh, interacting negatively. Uh, uh, Chatter. Yeah, I'd agree, and I guess I just, yeah, comes back to working with companies that have tested extensively and looked at and are providing good objective um, science to back up their products. Okay, um, let's see, we have a number of comments here. Um, Trace Genomics is a start, tracegenomics.com is a startup lab focused on low-cost gen genomic biosequencing of soil pathogen, beneficial species, nitrogen-fixing organisms, and more. Um, okay, and then someone else, uh, oh yeah, someone else said um, they contacted AgBio yesterday, and the person he spoke with said they weren't registered in Indiana. So um, I don't know if it's different for researchers, but um, whether you got different information? Uh, no, I, I'm aware of that conversation, um, but uh, we, we can grow it here because we're throwing away the produce, so. Okay, yeah. All right, um, let's see. Um, I know of one biofungicide that has shown increasing efficacy with increasing rates, but due to the cost, the label is set at perhaps lower than an ideal efficacy rate for economic reasons. Does this happen often? Uh, I, I'd hope there would be scientific uh, it, it's based on scientific data. That 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 would be my hope. But I I don't. Uh, um, I guess you'd almost have to be uh, have access to the uh, inner workings of the uh, economics of it. I, I know that same thing happens sometimes with, or some similar things happen with uh, uh, conventional fungicides where the, the they'll put a, a a uh, high rate on it, but growers won't use it because it's too expensive. I, I don't know if that happens with uh, bio stuff as well. I don't know. I can uh, add uh, inf some information about that. Uh, uh, I had the, the the opportunity to to get also this information from different sources, so I can confirm that in certain cases. Uh, there are also uh, some economic limitations that can uh, uh, force the producer to uh, um, indicate a uh, um, lower rate compared on what is uh, actually the optimal rate. This is just, uh, you know, some coming some, from some comments from some colleagues that uh, have tested these products. This is, I don't want to generalize, obviously, uh, but may happen. Yeah. 
Okay, we had that question earlier about um, biofungicides for downy mildew. Um, we have another one um, about whether you have any recommendations for biofungicides for powdery mildew on grape. Um, I, I, again, I don't work with grapes, but um, I would think uh, uh, some of the general fungicides should, should work with grapes. I think there is a, and we didn't cover it here, but it's actually a hyperparasite and I couldn't, I can't pull that information out of my head right immediately, but I think there's a hyperparasite for, for powdery mildew, and I think it would be general across uh, different crops. So that is uh, an organism that's a parasitic on 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 the powdery mildew fungus, but I, I, I'd have to research that. Okay. Um, we have time for one more question. I'll just read out this comment um, since it's a response to an earlier question. The person who asked about thrips and mites, um, this person also says Bovaria bastiana, like Botanigard might work, and also Metarhizium brenneum or Met52 or two myco insecticides that he says have efficacy against a range of insect and mite pests. Um, okay, so the question is, do copper and oxidate kill the bio, um, biological products that have been applied? Um, it, so, uh, it, the answer is it depends, I guess. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, so, for example, if you're using copper and um, uh, serenade, for example, for the, for the foliar application of serenade opti or serenade max, you're not counting on the living organism. So you could put those two together. On the other hand, I would think that if you're using copper or oxidate with pre-stop, you are counting on a living organism and that would be, uh, that would be bad. Uh, so also, anything that would act as a, as a hyperparasite, you, you, would, you would want to be careful. So I guess what I'm saying is you need to know, you need to know from the company and, uh, and, and in uh, research and coming up for this uh, presentation here, I did a lot of research, and, and that's why I wanted to group those into different categories. The, the ones that, that are living, when you, and you're counting on them living on the surface of the plant, and the ones that you aren't. The one that you are uh, counting on living on the surface of the plant, you would not want to put anything like uh, copper or oxidate in there. Another example is the, ag the agrophage. Uh, if you put copper in, on there, or if you're using spray equipment that's had copper in there, it, it, it's possibly going to kill the agrophage and ruin the effect. So I guess it's 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 kind of complicated. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone, who submitted questions and comments. Enough time to get to every single one, but we are out of time at the moment. So thank you very much, uh, Maria Teresa, Giuseppe, Lori, and Dan, for presenting this webinar. And we look forward to future webinars from these tomato projects.